Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In dentistry, the various x-ray examinations can be divided into two types. Those that employ a film that is small enough to fit within the oral cavity and those employing a film too large to fit in the oral cavity. The large films are examples of the extraoral type of examination and the small ones are the intraoral examination. Now, among the interoral examinations, we have the periapical, the bite wing, and the occlusal. This tape relates to the periapical examination and specifically the long cone paralleling technique for performing this examination. Shown here is a complete mouth examination made using the long cone paralleling periapical technique plus the interproximal examination. The interproximal examination constitutes the four films in the center of this array, whereas the periapical survey is shown by these films around the perimeter. 18 periapical films are involved. There are 10 number zero films used for radiographing the anterior teeth, five in the maxilla and five in the mandible. And then we have eight per, uh, number two size periapical films that are used for recording the posterior teeth, four on each side. In the center on the top row, we wish to portray images of the two maxillary centrals. In the next, we want to show the lateral, then the cuspid, then the bicuspids and the first molar, and finally the second and third molars. So these are the teeth that we wish to show in each of these several pictures. Now, going back to the center illustration, we will endeavor to open the mesial contact between the two centrals, and perhaps the distal contact will be overlapped. The distal of the central will be overlapped onto the mesial of the lateral. So in the next radiograph, we strive to open the mesial contact between the lateral and the central, thus showing the distal surface of the central, which we may have missed on the previous picture. Many times the distal surface of the lateral will be overlapped onto the cuspid. When we radiograph the cuspid, again, we try to open the mesial contact, thus showing the distal of the lateral and the mesial surface of the cuspid. The distal surface of the cuspid may be overlapped onto the bicuspid. So on the next radiograph, we endeavor to open the contact between the cuspid and the bicuspid, thus showing the distal side of the cuspid and the mesial of the first bicuspid, as well as the other contacts. So that's the scheme of events. Always try to open the mesial contact of the tooth that is currently being featured in the radiograph. There are two ways in which the film packet can be located in the mouth relative to the teeth. One, where the film lies at an angle to the long axis of the tooth, and the second, where the film is placed parallel to the long axis of the tooth. The results achieved by these two methods are vastly different. To determine the vertical angulation using the angular method of positioning the film requires that we bisect the angle formed by the plane of the film and the long axis of the tooth. 
I'm indicating now the location of the bisector. Then we must direct the central ray of the X-ray beam through the roots of the teeth and at right angles to the bisector. That locates the source of the X-rays somewhere off to the left. Now from that source, there is a ray that would record the root tip of the lingual root up at this level on the film. The buccal root would record at a lower level. And so it would appear as though the lingual root were that much longer than the buccal root. Whereas in actuality, the two are identically, uh, uh, they're of identical length. Now in the lower radiograph, or rather lower illustration, we determine the vertical angulation by directing the central ray at right angles to the long axis of the tooth and at right angles to the film packet. This has located the source of the x-rays off to the left someplace, and there is a ray that would pass parallel, or par pass through both root apices, and they would record on the film in their true relative heights. Uh, we have indicated that with the bisecting technique, the lingual root appears higher on the radiograph than does the buccal root suggesting that the lingual root is longer than the buccal root, but actually they're of approximately the same length. So here we see the apex of the lingual root and the two buccal roots appear much shorter. So this is an error in this kind of a technique. Also, a ray not shown would be the ray that passes parallel to the cheekbone, the malar bone casting the lower edge of the malar bone down here on the radiograph and the rest of the malar bone image covering the images of the roots. Just the thing we don't want to have happen. And here's the malar bone shadow covering the roots. The lingual and buccal cusps record widely separated. And this ray passes parallel or tangent to the edge of the supporting alveolar bone, causing the alveolar bone to appear almost down to the level of the lingual cusp. So we might say, doesn't he have remarkable bony support to his teeth? Extends down to the lingual cusp. Well, it certainly looks to be that way on our radiograph. There's the outline of the alveolar crest. The internal morphology of the pulp shows in a very gargoyle manner in this type of a radiograph. So now let's switch to the right angle technique. When the film is placed parallel to the long axis of the tooth, the proper vertical angulation is to direct the rays at right angles to the long axis of the tooth and at right angles to the film packet. There would be a ray which then would pass underneath the malar bone, the cheekbone, passing at the level of the roots and they record and their true relative heights. That is what we see here. The malar bone is cast way up at the top. The the true height of the alveolar bone records here. And you see this individual does not have bony support extending down to the lingual cusp of the teeth, but uh, at a normal level. Then we also have the two cusps recording in their proper relationship on the film, which again we see here. The internal morphology of the tooth is far better here than it was on the upper film. Here the internal morphology is, is all obliterated. So of the two radiographs, the lower one by far is preferable. It's a wonderful dream of positioning the film parallel to the long axis of the tooth 
and so let us put the film first close to the tooth. But unfortunately, we run into the roof of the mouth. We can't get up the film high enough to receive the image of the roots. So let's move it out away uh, from the tooth toward the midline, and now the film goes up higher. Shown with dotted lines are the paths of interested, interesting rays uh, generated using a short cone or eight inch technique. And we notice that they diverge quite widely. So the beam is getting of larger diameter quite rapidly as it leaves the source of the x-rays. Well, when the film is in the third position with the top of it at the midline of the mouth, we can now record the root apices for the first time. However, due to the enlargement of the image, the buccal cusp is cast below the film. And so unfortunately, the image has become enlarged and poorly defined. Now, if we move the source of the x-rays back from the x-ray uh, film, we now have the long cone technique represented here by the 16 inch technique and the rays no longer diverge as widely but are more nearly parallel. So the ray passing through the root apices records on the film in position number two, three, or four and the buccal cusp also record on the film in all four positions. So to counteract the tendency toward enlargement and poor definition which is necessitated by locating the film so remote from the tooth, we are forced to use a long cone on the, uh, the x-ray machine. Hence the name long cone paralleling technique. Now on this next slide, we have the pointed cone and this we would remove because this provided us with the eight inch technique. And we replace it then with the long cone which provides us with a 16 inch technique. So this is a double exposure showing the head of an x-ray machine with the pointed cone in place and then from the source of the x-ray to where the film would be in the mouth would give us about an eight inch technique and then we replace the cone with the long cone and from the source of the x-ray to where the film is located in the mouth would provide us with 16 inches of distance. There are five steps that we must execute in making our periapical survey. The first is the positioning of the film and the block in the mouth. The second is choosing the vertical angulation. The third, choosing the proper horizontal angulation. Fourth, directing the x-ray beam at the film and last, making the exposure. So we'll illustrate the first, the positioning of the film and the block. I have in my hand here the foam plastic bite block and I have a film packet. Now the film packet has a little black dot on the bottom. I'm going to insert the film packet into this slot so the black dot edge of the film goes down into this slot. So here we have the film in the bite block. It offers support almost to the top of the film. Forms a right angle between the surface of the film and the bite part of the block. We're looking at two films, the number zero film with its long dimension running vertically which is used for anterior teeth, and the number two size film with its long dimension running horizontally, and which is used for radiographing the posterior teeth. Next, we turn to the x-ray machine that we're going to use. Now, I have inserted in this open-ended cone a slender wire. Uh, this is to illustrate the a central ray of the x-ray beam. This is purely a hypothetical sort of a thing. On the side of the cone you see a dark line and it is also indicating the path of the central ray. Now if I
turn the apparatus down so that you're looking at the black line at the top of the apparatus, you see it too is pointing the path of the central ray. Now I want to take the film packet and place it in the patient's mouth. The top of the packet rests against the roof of his mouth. The biting edge of the teeth touch near the end of the, of the block. There we can see the long axis of the film and the long axes of the teeth are reasonably parallel, one to the other. Now I want to determine the proper vertical angulation. Now I'd like to direct the central ray parallel to the top edge of the block. Let's get in tight here so we can see this nicely. Central ray is a bit wiggly. That's not me wiggling. All right, there I have directed the central ray right along the top edge of the block. But unfortunately, we don't have a visible central ray to do this with, so we have to use instead the cone of the machine. So I am going to utilize the top edge of the cone. There you can see the top edge of the cone and the top of the block are lined up parallel. We can see an even uniformly wide strip of white block showing above the cone. This is how we have determined the vertical angulation. Here we have the long axis of the tooth simulated with a piece of orthodontic wire. And we see the long axis of the tooth is positioned parallel to the plane of the film. We wish to direct the rays at right angles to both the long axis of the tooth and the plane of the film. Here is a right angle indicated for us by the top of this uh, bite block. So this is going to be our clue for the direction of the rays. Then we turn to the next slide here. We're directing the rays parallel to the top of the block. And so the incisal edge of the film records where I'm indicating, and the amount of film inserted in this groove will turn out to be black border. The apex, the, the apex of the tooth records at this level, and then region superior to that also can record on the film. The type of radiograph that is produced then is pictured here. We have the tooth recorded in proper length, there is a small amount of black border reproduced under the incisal edge. That's the amount of film that was in the slot in the bite block. And we also have regions superior to the apices of the teeth in register. Now sometimes we get a bit careless in choosing the vertical angulation. And instead of directing the rays truly in the direction indicated by the block, we may direct the rays downward in this manner. And so the image of the incisal edge is cast below the film and never does record on the film. There'd be no black border. And at the same time, the apex is cast a little lower on the film, enabling us to see details located a little higher in the mouth. The type of result that we get is shown here. The incisal portion simply does not show there is no black border and the region that shows above the apices has been increased. Other, another type of error is where we, instead of directing the rays parallel to the block, may accidentally direct the rays upward in this manner. So then the image of the incisal edge is cast high up on the film and all of this amount of film turns out to be black border. For every millimeter of black border that we have added, we are losing at the other end of the film. 
And so the image of the apex of the tooth travels above the film and never does record. This is the result of that error. We have a very large black border in excess, and then we are deficient in root apices at this end. So it is very important that we choose the vertical angulation as is indicated by the bite block. Now the next step in the procedure is to determine the horizontal angulation. Now I'm going to bring the x-ray machine into position so the path of the central ray indicated by this black line will be oriented in the same direction that I am looking. I want to see between his two centrals and so that's exactly where the, uh, that's exactly um, how this line is pointing, in the same direction I am looking. So the rays will open this contact between the mesial surfaces of the centrals. The method of choosing the horizontal angulation just illustrated is suitable when you can see between a given pair of teeth, but there are regions of the mouth namely between the uh, molars where one cannot handily draw back the cheek far enough to sight between the teeth. So then we must rely on a second method for choosing the horizontal angulation. That method is known as the parallel method. Here we see a typodont to which I have fastened a popsicle stick. It's running parallel to the buccal surfaces of these molars. Now a second popsicle stick is located here and I want to fashion it, I want to fasten it to the end of the x-ray cone to help us visualize the, end, the plane of the cone and then I move the cone in so that finally the, the two sticks are parallel. Now you notice the the uh, path of the central ray indicated by the black line is, is aimed between the first and second molar and the two sticks are reasonably parallel. Now this parallelism is easily seen if you view your patient from the front of the mouth. Now of the two methods, the sighting method is the more accurate of the two, but we must fall back and use this one under these circumstances. The fourth step in making the periapical survey is to direct the beam at the proper spot on the film. Here you see the beam that is aimed too high. The center of the beam is above the film and the lower half of the film simply isn't exposed at all. Now looking at the typodont, this is the condition that we have right now. Now if I slowly bring the x-ray machine down. Now you see what the beam has done. There we have directed the center of the beam at the center of the film. Now we're not able to see the center of the film due to the presence of the teeth and so on. So in actual practice to achieve this degree of centering we direct the central ray at the gum line of the teeth. There you see the black line on the cone is aimed at the gum line of the teeth and the central ray when projected uh, would hit about at the center of the film. Then the last step is simply to expose the film. So this constitutes the series of five steps used in making the periapical survey. Now we'll actually produce the radiographs that we had described. Now, please sit back, Miss. We adjust the head position. In this technique, the exact head position is not at all important. So we'll not to spend much time on that. It works best if the occlusal plane is reasonably horizontal. 
Now I want to inspect her mouth. So open, please. I'm looking to see which teeth she has, which teeth she does not have, whether there are any dentures present, and things of this nature. Things look very normal. Now, if she had a uh, lot of lipstick on, I would provide a paper towel and uh, ask her to remove that, just so we don't get our fingers and the machinery all messed up. All right, next we'll go to a radiograph of the maxillary centrals. On this radiograph, we want to show the two maxillary centrals, and we will try to open the contact between the two. Perhaps the distal surfaces of the teeth will not show, but that's of small importance, for we'll show those surfaces on the next radiograph. There is a small amount of border showing beneath the incisal edges of the teeth. Next, we turn to the patient. I have inserted the film in the bite block. We're using the number one, or rather the number zero size film. Grasping it thumb and forefinger. Now open, please. Place the packet in the mouth so it rests against the roof of the mouth, and then bring the bite block against her teeth. Now this is how I want her to hold the film so that I can get my finger out. We ask her to gently close. All right, fine. She's biting well out toward the end of the block. So that is the first of the five steps, positioning of the film and the block. Next, we want to determine the vertical angulation. So I want to orient the head of the x-ray machine, or the cone of the x-ray machine, so it is parallel with the top edge of the block as you see it now. This has provided us with the proper vertical angulation. What number this is, I don't know. I couldn't care less. Next, we want to determine the horizontal angulation. So we bring the x-ray machine into position so its lower edge of the cone is slightly above her teeth. And we have chosen the horizontal direction so that the black line on the underside of the cone is pointing right down between her teeth. This is the same direction we must sight in order to, uh, to see between these teeth. Next, we view the patient from the side. And we're to the step, the fourth step, where we want to direct the center of the beam at the center of the film. So to do this, I have to elevate the patient so that the path of the central ray is aimed at her gum line. Then the next step is to make the exposure. But before we make the exposure, we ask her to close her lips over the teeth. And now, now we will make the exposure while the lips are closed. Following that, we remove the machine remove the cone, uh, re remove the film and the block, and um, the first picture is done. Next, we go to a radiograph that shows what would happen if she had not closed her lips. You notice the lower part of the tooth is very, very dark. Uh, it recorded so very dark on the radiograph by virtue of its thinness. All the rest of the tooth is covered either by lip and bone. So to equalize this inequity, we draw the lip down to protect the thin incisal edge from excessive exposure. The next exposure is made of the maxillary right lateral. And we endeavor to place it somewhat toward the center of the film. And we will choose the horizontal angulation so that we will open the mesial contact between the lateral and the central, thus affording us a view of the distal side of the central, which we may have missed previously. The distal side of the lateral may overlap with the cuspid, but that contact will be opened on the next radiograph. So now we'll demonstrate how the film is placed in the patient's mouth for this region. So again, we use the number zero size film in the bite block, grasping it between thumb and forefinger, 
placing it in the mouth with its upper edge against the roof of her mouth. And then I positioned it just as though I was going to do centrals once again, but instead we'll move around the corner slightly until the lateral is in the center of, of the block and then ask her to slowly close. That would be step number one. Steps two, three, four, and five would be followed in the same manner as I described with the centrals. Now we turn to the maxillary right cuspid region. On this film, we will endeavor to locate the image in the center of the film, and we will strive to open the mesial contact of the cuspid, thus showing the distal surface of the lateral. The distal surface of the cuspid is overlapped with the bicuspid, but that contact will be opened on the following radiograph. Now we turn to our patient, again using the number zero film in the bite block. Grasping the film between thumb and forefinger, we insert the film in the mouth, just as though we're going to do centrals once again, and then rotate around the corner until finally we have come to rest with the cuspid in the center of the block. Now gently close. Now we notice that there is only one cusp that is doing any holding on the bite block. This is a little precarious. And so I want to fill in the wide open spaces beneath the block with a cotton roll. So open, please. Now I insert the roll. Now close again. Now the film is positioned securely. Steps number two, three, four, and five would be the same as has been illustrated with the centrals. Next, we radiograph the maxillary right bicuspids and first molar. We endeavor to open the contact between the first bicuspid and the cuspid. This would afford us a view of the distal side of the cuspid, which we may have missed on the previous radiograph. In this illustration, he has metallic fillings, and uh, so it matters little whether this contact is opened properly or not. We're using a new size film, the number two size film. All right, here is the radiograph, uh, ra radiographic film. I'm showing the back surface now. And in this corner, there is a circle which indicates where the black dot on the radiograph will be located. Now I will insert this film in the bite block so the edge bearing that dot will be down in the crevice. Now our patient is a little girl and we're going to have difficulty positioning this large film in her tiny mouth. So I'm going to take liberties with the film and fold both the upper posterior and anterior corners. This hopefully will make it easier to accommodate to her small mouth. Grasping the film thumb and forefinger in the lower anterior corner, we insert the film in the mouth so the top of the packet rests against the palate of the mouth. Now slowly close, please. Next, we want to determine the vertical angulation. So we bring the x-ray machine into play between our eye, the observer's eye, and the uh, bite block. And I, I adjust the, the angulation so that we see a uniform strip of, uh, of bite block showing above the top of the cone. There, that's pretty good right there. This has established the vertical angulation. This is the second step in our procedure. Next, we go to our third step, which is the determination of the horizontal angulation. Now, for this one, I want to direct the central ray, the black line on the underside of the cone, 
about toward the center of the block, which would indicate somewhere near the center of the film, and with a direction that hopefully would open contacts. Now, if we can't sight between the teeth too well, we can fall back on the alternate method of lining up the buccal surfaces of the teeth parallel with the, the end of the cone, or vice versa. Right now, the, the central ray is aimed too high on the young lady's head. Also, I have to keep the machine away from her just a tiny bit. I want to raise her until the path of the central ray is aimed at the gum line of the teeth. All right, I think we have it about there. Now the fourth, uh, or the next step rather, the fifth step is to make the exposure. But before the exposure is done, we will ask her to close her lips. So then the exposure is completed, the machine drawn aside, and the film and block removed. The next region is that of the second and third maxillary molars. It also gives us another look at the uh, first molar. We will endeavor to place the film with its anterior edge in the center of the second bicuspid. That will uh, position the back edge of the film back far enough to include all of the third molar. We're again using the number three size film or rather number two size film. Now we'll insert the film in the patient's mouth in the same manner as we did before. Now gently close, please. Now you notice the film is some distance away from the teeth. The vertical angulation is determined, as we have in the past, by sighting over the top edge of the block. So the cone is parallel to the top of the block. Then the next step is to determine the horizontal angulation, so we draw the machine to the side of the patient. Well, now, there isn't a whole lot that one can see from this view. So a view from the front of the patient would be indicated. And here we will endeavor to line up the buccal surfaces of her teeth, as indicated by this stick, and the front of the cone indicated by this stick. When those two sticks, or those two lines, are parallel, then we're directing the rays in the proper direction. Now the anterior posterior positioning of the machine relative to the patient is such that the black line on the top of the cone is about opposite the outer corner of her eye. Right now we're aimed too high, and so I must raise the patient. This is the fourth step. Now the path of the central ray should be indicating about at the gum line. Then we ask her to close her lips while the exposure is made. Now, if the patient is one who does not allow us to get the film back so its front edge is in the center of the second bicuspid region, then we must change the horizontal angulation, angling the rays forward to cast the third molar's image onto the film. In this case, this maneuver was not necessary. Then we re remove the block and the film from the patient's mouth. This completes the survey of the maxillary arch. Next, we radiograph the two mandibular centrals. Using the number zero size film, we'll position it in the mouth so that these two teeth are centrally located and we'll endeavor to open the contact between the two. The distal contact of the lateral and the center, uh, the distal contact of the central with the lateral uh, may be overlapped. We'll pick that up next time. Now we turn to our patient. And for radiographing the lower teeth, I want her chin to be a little higher. 
Uh, the exact head position really isn't very important. It's just convenient to have her in this position. The film and block are fastened together and we'll put the film in the mouth in this manner. The edge of the film contacts the floor of the mouth under the tongue. I'm holding the film against the incisal edges of her centrals. Now gently close, please, to hold it there. And I'll take my hand away so that we can see how that is. Now her head is turned a little. So I've straightened it up. Next, we will determine the vertical angulation. We'll locate the cone between our eye and the and the block. There we have a uniform strip of, of block showing above the top of the cone. That has established the vertical angulation. Now we turn to step three, choosing the horizontal angulation. Now we locate the machine so the cone is purposefully, but temporarily, located beneath the uh, bite block so that we can see lower teeth. Now I want to direct the central ray right between her two centrals. And now we're to the fourth step where we want to direct the center of the beam at the gum line of the teeth. So I lower the patient until the uh, central ray is aimed at the gum line. Now please close your lips. Then we make the exposure remove the machine and the block and film. All right, this is the radiograph of the next region, the mandibular right lateral. It's uh, located reasonably to the center of the film and we strive to open the mesial contact. The distal contact, if overlapped, would be opened on the subsequent picture. We locate the film in the mouth just as though we were again going to do the central region and then we will rotate around the corner until we're centered over the lateral. And then bite, please. All right, that would be step number one. The subsequent steps two through five would be the same as I illustrated for the centrals. Then we go to the radiograph of the cuspid. And again, the cuspid is uh, the main tooth, so it's more or less in the center of things and we should like to have the mesial contact open. Unfortunately, in this illustration, it is not open. It should be. Then to, to perform that examination, again, we place the film packet in the mouth, just as though we're gonna do centrals all over again, and then rotate around the corner until finally we're centered over the cuspid. Steps two through five would be the same as we've illustrated for the centrals. This examination shows the mandibular right bicuspids and first molar. It also includes the distal of the cuspid. We're using a number two size film. Up until now, we've used the bite block in its entirety as pictured here. Now I'm going to crack off the end of it and uh, discard it. We no longer have need for the excessive length. I'm simply rounding the sharp edges of the bite block. I insert the block and the film together. Now this again is a, a small patient and in an effort to be kind I am going to roll the the lower anterior corner. Now we'll insert the film in the mouth, starting it down between the teeth and the tongue, scooping it under the tongue and then straightening it up. Gently close, please. All right, viewed from the side, we see that the front edge of the film is located in the center of the cuspid. All right, next we determine the vertical angulation. So we bring the x-ray machine between the observer's eye and the block and manipulate it 
until the upper edge of the cone is lined up with the edge of the block. This time I'm using the lower edge of the block. All right, we've determined the vertical angulation. I swing the machine to the side. The third step in the procedure is to determine the horizontal angulation. So here we're aiming the central ray beneath the block and in a direction that hopefully will open the contacts. Now we must adjust the height of the patient. Now she is located too high and so we will lower her until the path of the central ray is, is aimed about at the gum line. Then her final instruction, close your lips. Then we will make the exposure. And then remove the machine and the film. Pictured here are the mandibular second and third molars. We're using a number two size film with its long dimension running horizontally. The film is positioned in the mouth just as we did for the bicuspids, except the front edge of the film is located in the center of the second bicuspid. The manner of retention is identical as before, and all the subsequent steps are the same as we used with the bicuspid shot. There is an alternate method of radiographing the uh, molar region, and that is to use a finger to hold the film in the patient's mouth. This I will demonstrate. The film packet is placed in the mouth positioned vertically and then the lower edge is swung underneath the person's tongue and then once again positioned vertically and now take your left index finger your elbow up and hold against the uh, film packet against the teeth there you can see the film packet in position its front edge is about in the middle of the second bicuspid. A small amount of border protrudes above the occlusal surfaces of the teeth. We will aim the x-ray beam in the same direction indicated by the occlusal surfaces of, of her teeth. We direct the center of the beam at the, at the center of the film. Then the exposure is made, then the machine is removed, the film removed, and the patient dismissed. Thank you. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.